So we are, we're, we're, we're trying a, a new experiment with this class. We've never recorded it before. And so now for the first time we are recording it. Unfortunately, the, uh, this is a four week course and the first three parts were not recorded. So this starts out fresh with the final class. So you can't go back to the earlier classes. But in the future, we, we're gonna try to give the same course every other month. So we will give uh, this course again, I understand in March. And starting next week, we will have a four week course on meditation 101, beginning meditation that uh, my good friend Stephen will teach. So uh, in this fourth and final class, we're actually getting to the deepest part of, uh, hi Lois, how are you? <laughs> So we're getting to the, the very deepest part of uh, Buddhism. Of course, it's the end. So we're at, we're at the very deepest part. So it is sort of, so it's a lot of fun stuff. But even if some of you have missed the earlier stuff, sort of each unit is sort of independent of itself. And all Buddhism, in my mind, is all sort of interrelated. So you can start teaching anywhere. And wherever you start teaching, it all gets repeated over and over again. So if you have just started and you um, have missed earlier parts, it really won't matter. So in the earlier parts, we started out uh, with just the, the bare basics. What is Buddhism? The life of Buddha? How Buddhism spread? And then we spent a, a pretty much a whole class in the Four Noble Truths, which is Buddha's deepest teaching. And then since then, we've... Uh, uh, started following a path by Lama Sankapa uh, uh, that we've been following called Foundation of All Good Qualities. And this, this text is a very short text and it's good because it summarizes the whole Buddhist path from the very beginning to full enlightenment. So we started with the very basic ideas of renunciation and so forth. And so now we're going to get to the, the good stuff. What happens when you get close to, enlight, close to enlightenment? How do you actually do that final step and become enlightened? So, so it should be quite interesting. Um, so the main topics, um, where we were at the end of last week was we had just begun talking about bodhicitta, which is the fundamental uh, teaching of the Mahayana path, which is what almost all Buddhism is today. Uh, there is still one type of Buddhism in Sri Lanka and places like that called Theravadan Buddhism, which is called so-called Hinayana. Uh, but we are on the Mahayana path. And the Mahayana path is really defined by this notion of bodhicitta that we've been talking about. And so today we're going to continue talking about bodhicitta. And we're going to talk about how you actually acquire bodhicitta. So the sort of the nuts and bolts or however nuts and bolts I can give in maybe 10 minutes because because <laughs> this is a full outline and we don't have much time to to do everything. And then after that, we're going to get into some of the higher aspects of the path and we're going to talk about the deepest uh, truth in Buddhism, the Buddhist notion of reality or how things really are. And that is uh, commonly called emptiness. So we'll get into that a little bit also. And then we're going to follow that up with, uh, with the final major topic, which is Tantra, or sometimes called the Vajrayana path. Uh, and that is, in a certain sense, it's the, the speeded up path to enlightenment. And a lot of people are often very curious about that. Most people have wrong ideas about what's involved with that. But it is, it's an important part of the Mahayana path. And it should not be viewed as separate from the Mahayana path. It's sort of like if you like a speeded up Mahayana path. Uh, so anyway, that's the goal. And then we'll, we'll end up and start from there. So before I begin, let me just ask if there's any questions from last week or if anybody has any, if any questions about what I've said so far, maybe. Hopefully it's not too overwhelming. I mean, this, we're covering all of Buddhism in four weeks, so we're going pretty fast. And I always feel like I'm a little bit out of breath. But, <laughs> but anyway, hopefully I'm not going too fast that you can't follow it. So does anybody have any comments or questions? Okay. So uh, let's go ahead then and uh, begin. 
So last week I, I talked about bodhicitta. So, you, so again, let me just remind you, what is bodhicitta? So bodhicitta is this notion of all of us having compassion for all sentient beings. And, uh, and what we come to realize is that is we develop this wish to help all sentient beings from this, relieve their suffering. And as I said before, we come to realize that the only way to do that in any way that's efficient at all is ourselves to become a Buddha. Because if we're just an ordinary people, you know, we can influence a few people around us and, you know, maybe through Zoom, maybe you can even go a little bit further. Somebody like the Dalai Lama can influence a lot of people, but there's so many sentient beings, so many uh, sentient beings means a being with a mind. So it includes human beings, but it also includes other beings and the Buddhism actually even animals and so forth as we talked about and other beings. But for now, it's, if, if you want, you can just sort of think of it as human beings uh, if you're a beginner and it really doesn't matter. But, but anyway, um, so, so that's what bodhicitta is. So bodhicitta is the wish for ourselves to attain full enlightenment, to become a full Buddha. And the reason we're doing that is not just so that we enjoy eternal happiness, no, never any suffering, so forth. So it's not a selfish reason, it's an altruistic reason. The reason is for us to actually help all other sentient beings also become a Buddha. Because when all other sentient beings become a Buddha, that relieves all of their suffering forever also. And of course, along the way, uh, we also wanna relieve the temporary suffering of all of the sentient beings, of course, as well, as much as we can. But anyway, the best way that we can help the most people is for ourselves to become a Buddha. So that's the motivation. So what we're gonna talk about today is how do you do that? How do you actually develop this bodhicitta? Because as, as I've said before in Buddhism, nothing magically happens. Everything in Buddhism is cause and effect. And if you don't create the causes for something to happen, it's not gonna happen. So if you want to uh, achieve bodhicitta, it's just not gonna fall out of the sky and hit you over the head. You actually have to be active and you have to do something to develop that inner quality of bodhicitta in it. So before you begin though, um, and this is sort of a general way that all Buddhism works. Whenever you want to develop any quality or develop any sort of spiritual aspect, the beginning is, is why? What motivates you? Why would you want to do it? Because any of this stuff has always involved some work and effort. It's not, you know, it's, it's not all completely easy. So it involves some effort. So the first thing is, is you have to say, well, why should I put that effort into developing bodhicitta? And we talked a little bit about that last week. So I can't, again, I, if I repeat everything, I'll never get to the end of this one. But um, some of the benefits of bodhicitta that we talked about last week is it's a way that you can attain nearly infinite good karma or merit. Because as, I, as I've said before last week, you know, if you feed one hungry person, you help one person. If you feed two hungry people, then in principle, you should generate roughly twice as much good karma because you've helped two people. If you feed 10 people, 10. Well, in bodhicitta, your motivation is actually to help every sentient being. And since that's nearly an infinite number of, of people, every time you act with that motivation, you're generating nearly an infinite amount of positive karma. So it's, it's such a powerful tool and in fact, the reason why, if you're gonna become a full Buddha, you need almost an infinite amount of, again, if you're gonna become a, a, a Buddha, you have to generate the causes and conditions to become a Buddha. And since a Buddha is such a powerful spiritual being who essentially is an infinite spiritual being, you have to create almost an infinite amount of good karma to achieve that result. And so you need something that's powerful enough to achieve such a, an amazing goal. And bodhicitta is your tool because bodhicitta is the way that you can generate vast amounts of good karma, which is what you need to become a Buddha. So that's sort of the logic of it all. 
along the way, the other thing that, uh, another benefit of bodhicitta is that it, it destroys self-cherishing. It destroys the sort of selfish attitudes of our life, which is the main reason why we create negative karma. So not only are you creating all this positive karma, but you're greatly dampening down the normal things that would make you generate negative karma. So that all by itself is a powerful tool that will help you also reduce your suffering. Another benefit that I didn't talk about last week is sometimes they, they, they say that when you become a Buddha, you are sort of almost like a, in the lineage of Buddhas. You are a Buddha, sort of a beginning Buddha, if you like. And therefore you are a precious being. And, um, and one way to think about it is you think, you take a person, you say, I'm, I've got this person whose goal is to help every sentient being. I mean, how, what could be more precious than that than somebody who, who is striving as hard as they can to help every sentient being? So, you know, so it's not just a simple altruistic person that wants to maybe help his family. But it, it's sort of like uh, Mother Teresa on steroids, if you like. So, it's, so you become a very precious human being when you develop this notion of bodhicitta. Uh, and then finally, because you are, because you know, this bodhicitta is generating so much enormous positive karma, you are actually transforming your life in an amazing way. And it leads to a path of bliss because you're generating all this good karma and this good karma is going to lead to, uh, uh, to great bliss. In fact, Lama Yesha, who was one of the people who started our, our local centers and tradition, he said, uh, in fact, he was quoting J. Sakapa, who was actually started the whole Galupa tradition of the Tibetan tradition, which the Dalai Lama belongs to. He said, when you have bodhicitta, all the good things in life are magnetically attracted to you and poured down upon you like rain. You know, and that's all that good karma coming together. So bodhicitta is this amazing thing and people go on and on. There's, there's a whole book by Shantideva on the Bodhisattva's way of life. And he spends huge chapters and discussions of all the wonderful things that happen to you from this bodhicitta. So anyway, that's the beginning stage, you know, and again, uh, I can only give you this, you know, this quick, three minute introduction, but it's, it's a vast topic of why bodhicitta is so amazing and so powerful. And, but that's the starting point because unless you have this motivation and you really wanna do it, you're not gonna do it. So once, so let's say that I've convinced you, <laughs> my three minute talk was helpful. And let's say you wanna develop bodhicitta now. Well, how are you gonna do it? And in uh, our tradition, there's actually uh, two methods that are done. And there are sort of, sometimes they call them lineages. There's two different approaches. Uh, one I think is probably the best for us because it's a simple, most straightforward, and it leads you in a very gentle step-by-step -step path. The other one, uh, and I think this one was developed by a song guy. I forgot to write down who developed this. Uh, but anyway, the second one I think was developed by Shantideva. And it's a much more difficult one, but it's a more, in a way, a very deep and penetrating way of looking at the world that causes you to, helps you develop bodhicitta. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the simpler one. So the simpler one is called Sevenfold Cause and Effect. And as the title suggests, it's gonna be a seven step process. So basically, if you're gonna develop this bodhicitta, you need a strong motivation. And ultimately it's gonna be an amazing compassion for the suffering of other beings that's gonna drive you into this development of bodhicitta. Uh, but before you develop great compassion, you first of all has to develop a great love for people because that's what drives great compassion. And before that, you have to reach the point where you can actually develop love for all sentient beings. So the question of it is, is how do you go about that? And in this sevenfold uh, cause and effect path, it starts um, in the very, at a very gentle level. So it says, well, before you develop love for people, 
first of all, you got to start stop hating all these people. <laughs> And so it, it's the notion that you have to develop equanimity. And equanimity is a word in Buddhism that's used different ways in different contexts. But in this context, what they mean by equanimity is they mean treating everybody the same. So developing the same feeling about everybody. For us, that's not an ordinary way that most people live their lives. Most people, when they live their lives, they, you know, you love your family and your spouse and your relatives and your good friends and you, you feel like you have a special relationship with them. They're special and you sort of prioritize them above everybody else. At the same time, people that you dislike, uh, we, we will, to, to be brief, we'll call them enemies, although maybe that's a little, most of us don't, I think, have really strong enemies, but, you know, but people you really don't like that you, you know, that raise hackles in you, uh, again, um, that's not going to work either, because ultimately we're going to have to develop uh, great compassion and love for every sentient being, even these people that we don't like. So, we're gonna to have to get there step by step because in the beginning, we can't do that. It's just not normal. We're not used to that. So, so in the beginning, we start off doing meditations on equanimity and there's a whole logic behind it. And there's, some, there's helpful ways of thinking that can help you develop this kind of equanimity. Things like you realize how everything in life is impermanent. And we realize that sometimes we'll have a very good friend you know, we'll get in a tiff with them and then they'll become our enemy. And sometimes our enemies, we misjudge people and we get to know them better and we get to like them and they become our friends. So this category of friend or enemy is actually a very fluid path. And once you start thinking along lines like that, and there's other ways of thinking that help you develop this equanimity, which again, I don't have time. I, mean, I can't give you the full teaching. I could just sort of give you the rough idea. But anyway, you can sort of see how if you work at it, you can actually reach a point where you, so, you sort of see that everyone is equal. And everyone, um, and, and, and so you can work at developing this equanimity. And that's the first step. So the first step is everybody is sort of equal and, and you're not developing these huge feelings of hatred toward enemies and, and love for uh, dear ones. So that's the first step. The second step is something that seems very artificial for most Westerners. Uh, and I, I will say it and you'll probably think that I'm nuts <laughs> unless you've heard it before. But it's a notion um, that recognizing that all living beings are our mothers. So how does that work? So what does it mean that all living beings are our mothers? This has to do with the notion of rebirth, that all of us have had pretty much infinite rebirths in the past. And if we've had infinite rebirths in the past, every time we've been reborn, we've had a mother. So if every time we've been, been born, we've had a mother, you can say, well, where are those mothers? Well, all of those mothers are all of you. So all of you at one time have been my mother, and at one time I've been your mother. It might have been five eons ago, but you know, if you think about it logically, there is this notion that everyone has been our mother. And what's helpful about this notion is uh, again, we're, we're moving toward developing this love for everybody. And especially, and, and imagine not only everybody's been our mother, but everybody's been a good mother. Because the thing that all people say, well, I had this terrible mother. And all. So, so think about, but, but if you've had countless eons before, at some earlier point, whoever that person is, they must have had a chance to have been a good mother. So imagine that all of these sentient beings at some previous time have been a good mother. So if you have a mother, you not, especially a good mother, you have this natural love for her. And what happens when your mother dies, you still have that love for her. I mean, for me, that's actually very fresh because my mother who died just in June, uh, albeit she was three weeks short of 100. <laughs> but, but anyway, she, you know, I don't stop loving her because she's died. 
Well, you can say, well, what about, so what if my mother died three lifetimes ago? You should still feel love for her. So we, so we start with this notion of, okay, again, it's very artificial, but it doesn't matter because if you meditate on this and think about it, it helps you start developing love for everyone. Because if everyone has been our good mother, we then have a motivation. But then it, you even go into greater detail because you start thinking about the kindness of mother beings. So if you had a good mother, you remember her kindness because when you remember her kindness, that sort of accelerates your love for her. And then having remembered her kindness, that naturally develops this notion of wanting to repay her kindness. So I think for all of us, you know, if we've had a good mother, we try to do things for her. You know, we celebrate their birthdays, we give gifts, we, you know, we celebrate good mothers. We want to repay the kindness that they've shown us. And so we develop meditations on that. And then the next stage is from that, then we develop affectionate love. And this affectionate love is the love you have for your parents, for your siblings, for your good friends. It's just the normal affectionate love that we have for people. So at this point, especially since we've imagined all other sentient beings as having been our mother, at this point, we're starting to develop affectionate love for every single sentient being. So, and, and, and again, uh, uh, the best way to do this is through meditations. And there are guided meditations that can lead you through all of this. And it's helpful ways of thinking about it, but that's the goal. So we work on this. So we do these meditations. We keep thinking about everyone else has, has, who has been as being a good mother that we wish, who we loved. And, and so, we, so we work on this trying to develop this affectionate love for everyone. Uh, and then from that affectionate love, we then look and we see all these people that are suffering because almost everybody in life suffers at one point or another. You know, we all have illnesses, we have problems. Um, you know, sometimes even people who themselves are very good sometimes have children that act out or something. Everybody has problems. And if you have this tremendous love for somebody, you generate compassion automatically. You can't help yourself. You know, if you have a, a child and your child breaks your, your leg, I mean, it, it nearly breaks your heart to see your child suffer. And so that's how you develop this compassion. You first, you develop the love and then you see him suffering. And compassion in Buddhism is defined very simply. Compassion is the wish to get rid of the suffering of others. So, uh, and, and, and so to actually free other people from their suffering. And so if you have, and, and so, but before you're gonna have this, you know, if we have just a stranger and something, I don't know, they get hit by a car or something, you know, we probably feel terrible and we feel sad, but we don't feel anywhere near the same compassion that we would feel if it were our own child, our own son or daughter getting hit by the car. So, so, so this development of affectionate love is a critical first stage. And, and then here, what we're talking about is compassion. At this point, they call it great compassion and they use this word great. And the word great means it's not compassion just for our kids, for our family, for our good friends. It's compassion for every sentient being. And, and it's because we view every other sentient being as, a, as this lovable mother. And, and, and so it's these types of meditations that, de, that lead you to develop great compassion. So now we come to the clincher. So we, we've come along, we see all these different people suffering. We have this amazing amount of compassion for it. And it's said that bodhisattvas are, are driven, they just, you know, they have such a great compassion, they almost can't stand it. They see someone suffering and it, they, it feels like, like they're suffering. They almost can't stand it. So strong is their compassion. Well, if you feel great compassion like that, what happens? You develop the wish to actually relieve their suffering. So for example, if you had a small child that went swimming in the lake and then suddenly started drowning, would you stand there? No, you dive into the water and you try to save your child. 
you 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 couldn't you know you you could not bear the thought of your child drowning. You would do. I mean, pe mothers and people do amazing heroics. Sometimes they're strong enough to even lift cars off of somebody and so forth. It's amazing what kind of power you can develop if you have this amazing compassion for your own child. But imagine if you had that same compassion for everybody, for everyone you meet, you had that same level of compassion. You would have the same wish to free them from their suffering, which is what compassion is. So you'd have this wish to actually do something. And that's what real bodhicitta involves, is this actual decision. Yes, I'm going to do something about it. And again, like I say, especially if you're a Buddhist, you realize that, you know, sometimes you can help people by feeding them, you can help them if you take care of them if they're sick. But when you understand how karma works, you realize that ultimately, the only way to really help people is to help them on their own spiritual path so that they that will stop producing all the negative karma that creates all the problems in their lives that leads to their suffering. So you can do these temporary band-aids, which are good, absolutely good, feeding people that are hungry, you know, you know, being supportive of people that have emotional problems, but ultimately the best thing you can is help them with their spiritual past. And to do that, as we talked about in some of the previous classes, the best way to do that is for yourself to become this amazing spiritual being. You know, when we look at around us, we see, you know, if in our center, you look at somebody like Geshe Shara, who's this amazing bodhisattva, who's so spiritually deep and kind, and people just naturally gravitate to him. And someone like that has far more power to help people than I can help them or any of us in this room, you know? When you see these amazing spiritual people, they just naturally connect to people and they have so much power to benefit people. And I think a, a more extreme example of that is the Dalai Lama. Think about how many people the Dalai Lama influences and helps and gives spiritual, you know, help and uh, inspiration to. And, and then if you extrapolate that, then of course, the, the best way is somebody who's the, the full power of an infinite spiritual being, which is a Buddha. So that's what drives you. So once you have this great compassion for everybody and you can't stand it and you have to help them, it drives you to complete your own spiritual path, which then drives you to actually become a Buddha yourself. Because it's not an easy path to become a Buddha. It's a long spiritual path. And only if you have an amazing, powerful motivation will you have the strength to actually push it through all the way to the end. And so this bodhicitta that you're developing has that power, and that's how it will accomplish that. And uh, along these regards, I should say that there's actually different levels of bodhicitta. So there's things called aspiring bodhicitta. And there's, a, I don't know, I, I can't go into all the different categories, but the two that are important is there are some which they call artificial bodhicitta. So artificial bodhicitta is the bodhicitta that most of us are working on. It's all of us trying to, in ourselves, develop compassion for more and more people and more universal compassion more love and compassion. And, you know, and that's where most of us are for most of the time, working on this, improving it, doing more meditations deeper, just constantly working at trying to develop this. Uh, and of course, we'll get better and better. And our bodhicitta will increase more and more. But all of this bodhicitta is called artificial bodhicitta. It's not the real bodhicitta. The real bodhicitta occurs at a certain point. It's like you, your compassion grows, your bodhicitta grows bigger, bigger, bigger. At some point, you hit sort of a threshold. And when you hit that threshold, suddenly it's like black and night. Things change. And what changes is you have what's called spontaneous bodhicitta. And spontaneous bodhicitta is the real bodhicitta. That's the bodhicitta that you can never turn it off. It's just spontaneous. It's just there, day and night, every, min every minute of your life, that bodhicitta is, pres is present. You just can't stop 
you can't turn off this compassion you have for all sentient beings and this amazing motivation. And, and so that's the goal. And it's this spontaneous bodhicitta, this real bodhicitta, that's going to drive the final path to full enlightenment, because that's what's going to have the power to drive the final path. And so I'm going to talk about this final path a little bit more. But before I get to that, I'm just going to mention this other method of, of uh, acquiring bodhicitta, which is very, very powerful, very, very deep but it takes somebody who's very spiritually advanced to do it. And this is the method, I think it was proposed, really pushed very hard by Shantideva. And it's called equalizing and exchanging self with others. And I think even if you don't follow this path, it's really just the ideas and concepts of it are so helpful. It's so amazing. So the idea of it is, is something that I talked about in one of the earlier classes. It's, you know, really a part of, uh, bodhic of uh, Buddhism. And it's this notion of, in Buddhism, we recognize that every single one of us is really at the deepest level the same. So on the surface, we have different personalities, we're male, female, whatever. Uh, you, know, we, you know, we have our histories, our biographies that are all different. But the one thing that is the same where we have a common ground with everyone is that all of us want to be happy and all of us want to avoid suffering. And, um, and that's actually a very, very profound thing. And when you reach the level, and, and actually I think understanding that at a very deep level is actually a, a deep spiritual realization. When you really get it, we're really all the same. We all want to be happy and we all want to avoid suffering. And, and, and that has, when you really get that, that has huge repercussions on your life. For example, when you get that idea, how can you ever be greedy again? Because greedy means me acquiring something at somebody else's expense, because that's what greed, you know. So I'm willing to steal from people to cheat on people, to harm people in various ways. So I get more of what I want, what I think is better for me. So when you're doing that, you're saying, I am more important than this other person. Because if you have this notion of equality, you know, you ask yourself, how in the world could I think that I should get more than this other person? This other person wants happiness just as much as I do. So why should I get all the good things and why should they suffer on behalf of me? It makes no sense whatsoever. So this notion of you know, this equalness that we're all the same is, is really, really profound. And it's that equalness that drives this equalizing and exchanging self with others. Because then what happens is, uh, so, so I've done the first one, the equalizing. So this equalizing is this profound spiritual insight that we're all the same. And uh, you know, so we should treat all the people the same. I should treat you the same way that I want you to treat me. We should all take care of each other. So, so once you have this idea of equalizing, what does the exchanging self with others means? So this is a little bit crazy because it, you know, sometimes we, we, we talk about, well, I wanna step into somebody else's shoes. So that would be sort of one notion of sort of exchanging self with others, but that's not the sort of thing that we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is this notion of um, sort of who we put first, let me put it that way. So let me talk about ordinary egotism, so selfishness. So, so with ordinary egotism and selfishness, there's this notion, I put myself first. So if I'm in line, I want to be in first in line. If they're handing out cake, I want the biggest cake. If they're handing out money or you're acquiring money, I want the most money. So it's I, I, I. I am, I put myself as in the place of prominence. You know, it's I put myself first. Well, what the exchanging self with others is, is flipping that. So instead of putting myself first, you put others first. So if you're standing in line, you're saying, oh, I'm so happy you other people are in front of me and that you're going to get to the head of the line before me. 
Or, you know, you're driving down the road and somebody cuts in front of you, you say, oh, I'm so happy that you're getting to wherever you want faster. And I'm, so, so in other words, what you're doing is you're cherishing others more than you cherish yourself is sometimes the way, because the other notion of an egotistical or thing we talk about is self-cherishing is another ter terminology. So normally we cherish ourselves most of all. When you're exchanging self with others, you think first about the happiness of others instead of yourself. And so that's what the exchanging self with others is. And what you discover when you do that is you discover this makes you extraordinarily blissful and happy. And it's a funny thing because in Buddhism we say, if you wanna really be happy, try to make others happy. And that will make you happier than you could ever have been on your own. And this sounds to, if nobody's ever played with this much, it sounds ridiculous. So you have to actually go out and play with this yourself. And I suggested in an earlier class, a way of doing that. You know, you go into a grocery store, if you can, or, or maybe a better thing is driving down the street now, COVID. So you're driving down the street and uh, somebody cuts in front of you and you develop this wish for the other person to be happy. You think, may you be happy. I'm happy that you're getting in, getting in front of me and going wherever you want to be as fast as you want. And, and you just, you look at people around you and you say, may you be happy. And you genuinely wish for those other people to be happy. If you're, you know, if, if you don't have COVID and you're in a grocery store and you see the cash register, you just develop this wish, may you be happy. And, and you genuinely feel that. And if you start developing this wish, what you will discover is you will feel this inner glow. You will start feeling happy. It is stunning how such a simple thing can make such a difference. And then it's like your whole world. When, and then you do that with the person in front of you in line. You do that with sort of all the people around. You keep wishing, may you be happy. And you genuinely wish that they are happy. When you start doing that, it's like your whole world becomes this magical, wonderful world. It's, it's truly astonishing. So anyway, I, I've done this myself and, and you can even do this lying in bed at night. You can lie in bed at night and just think about people you know and you can just say, you can wish for them to be happy. And if you're doing it in Buddhism, we always start easy and work difficult. So start with your own children and family, loved ones, friends, and then work out. And, and this is actually a tool for developing love for even people you don't like, because eventually you can extend this to people. Maybe, you know, they're a little bit irritating, but you don't actually dislike them. And then eventually you can reach it. So you can develop this attitude. So you can actually even wish the person that you like least to be happy. And, and actually the Buddha himself, the historical Buddha recommended this. He talked about universal love. He talked about sitting and just wishing every sentient being to be happy. And he said that this was the most powerful way that you can acquire great, huge amounts of positive karma. So if you wanna generate huge amounts of positive karma, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to work in a homeless shelter. You don't have to go to great extremes. Just lie in bed at night, just wishing for every single person, including animals, every single sentient being to be happy. Just develop that wish and see the feelings that bubble up in you. You know, just try it out. So anyway, and, and, and this wish for everybody to be happy is in a sense very close to bodhicitta. And, and bodhicitta is intimately sort of interconnected with this. Uh, these are, this, this is called one of the four uh, immeasurables because it, it's love for immeasurably infinite number of human beings. But that's actually intimately connected with bodhicitta. Because as I said, that was a beginning stage of this sevenfold uh, path for achieving bodhicitta. So anyway, that's, um, that's what equalizing and exchanging self with others is, is that's how you develop bodhicitta. You start working on these meditations to help you develop uh, first equalizing self with other and then wishing to exchange self with others. And, and if you follow that path, that will lead you to the same endpoint of bodhicitta. But, but as I said, you, you can see it's a lot more subtle, a lot more difficult. 
I think it's not for beginners. <laughs> but some people, you know, it's funny, different people have different karma. And for some people, they'll jump on this immediately. And this will feel so natural that they'll just go right there, uh, just right away. Okay, so now, so, so that's what bodhicitta is. Uh, now I wanna talk about one other uh, short topic. Uh, and the reason I talk about it is just because it's so powerful. And it's part of the same Mahayana path. And it actually is, a, I think, another way to actually help you develop and enhance your bodhicitta. And this is, uh, in the Tibetan, it's called lojong. Uh, another way they talk about it is they often talk about it as training the mind. And it's a path that was developed, uh, I don't know, I forget when it was developed, maybe seventh, eighth century AD, I forget when, but a long time ago. And originally it was developed, uh, some monk came up with this and he just discovered it was such a powerful practice. And he actually kept, kept it secret and he would only teach it to a few uh, close disciples of his. And then those few close disciples passed it down and uh, eventually it came to this one monk who was actually working with lepers. And this monk that was working with lepers just thought, you know, this practice is so powerful for me. I wonder if it would help these lepers. So he started teaching these lepers this practice. And this practice was said to be so powerful that actually some of the lepers were becoming cured. <laughs> So, so, you know, and then he was just sort of blown away. And then gradually people, again, they just thought it was just such amazing that they have to let it out. So eventually it became uh, let out to the larger community. And, and in a sense, it's, it's just a, sort of almost uh, has many, it's almost like an enhanced bodhicitta. So the most powerful part of this, I'm just gonna give you, I mean, uh, you know, I can't, I can only give you a few minutes on this but I'll give you two pieces of this. So one piece, which is the most powerful piece of all is called taking and giving. And again, it's, it's just a way of thinking, if you like. It's a way of, in, in Buddhism, there's a lot of imaginative, almost fantasy-like ways of thinking, but these, these imaginative ways of thinking are nonetheless almost real. They're so powerful. And they're ways, they're actually ways of actually changing your mind, which is really the goal of Buddhism. So the way that taking and giving gives is the first part is taking. So in taking, um, I'll give a simple example. Let's say you've broken your leg and your pain, your leg is just hurting you like crazy. And it's just, you know, it's extremely painful. It's really bothering you. So what you do is you sit down and you do this little meditation. And what this meditation consists of is you start thinking about everybody else in the world who has also broken their leg. And you think about, you know, and some people may have had broke their leg in five places, maybe, you know, far more horrendously than you have. Maybe they've even lost their leg. So you start thinking about all of these people who may be suffering huge amounts more than even you are. And you develop the wish, mentally you, you develop uh, a wish of taking on all of the suffering of all of these other people who have broken their leg. And you wish to take their pain upon yourself. And there's visualizations, you visualize it in the form of black smoke entering your body and so forth. But you wish, you in, mentally, you develop this imaginative um, imaginative way of looking at it as though you are taking upon yourself all of their suffering so that they don't have to suffer anymore. So it's, so it's a, in a sense, it's a huge bodhicitta thing. And of course, you're not actually taking on your, their pain. You don't have to worry about it. You know, it's, uh, I've done this thing many times. I've never been struck down with these extraordinary pains. But it's, it's more, it's the mental attitude that's important. It's this wish. And again, you visualize it. It's a visualization. You visualize this black smoke entering you and entering your heart where you're taking on all their suffering. So that's the first part of it. And then the second part of it is you wish 
that you were giving them in return sort of all of your happiness. And in fact, you almost imagine yourself as being a Buddha and having infinite happiness and giving back to all of these people your happiness. So on one hand, you're taking away your suffering. And on the other hand, you're giving them all of your happiness. And you often do this with the breath. So as you breathe in, you're taking on all of their suffering. And as you're breathing out, you're sending out white wisdom light to all of these beings, giving them amazing happiness. So that's what taking and giving is. So it sounds a little strange and you say, well, why is this so powerful? And uh, I myself have done this at, at very, whenever I'm in deep trouble, this is, this is the, the thing that I do most. Um, and um, I, I think it was uh, 2007, I had gallstone pancreatitis, which is one of the most painful things you can have. And I did this practice. Uh, I, I, when I was in the hospital, which for almost for two weeks, the two practices I did were patient acceptance of whatever pain I was suffering, because that removes whatever negative karma was inflicting me with all of this pain and illness. And the second thing I did over and over again was this taking and giving. And actually for me, I was only able to do half of it because the pain was so intense. I couldn't imagine having any happiness to give anybody. So I just practiced the giving part of it. I was taking these, uh, these things that were 80 times more powerful than morphine and they still weren't really taking away the pain. So it was very drastic, but it just completely transformed my whole illness in the hospital. It was amazing. And the one thing that it does that which makes it so powerful is it really does this equalizing self with others because when you're doing this practice, so when I was doing this practice, I was thinking about everybody else that had pancreatitis and wishing to take all of their suffering upon myself. But when you're thinking about that, what it does is it stops you from thinking about yourself. So the thing that makes everything so painful is you're thinking about my pain. Oh, this is hurting so much. I can't stand it. You just meditate in your pain. So instead of meditating on your pain, you're thinking about the pain of others. And even that all by itself is so amazing. It's so amazing, so transformative. The other time I did this was a time when my daughter who was uh, working on ski patrol up in Santa Fe, um, she got lost at night, spent the night on the mountain. And normally from exposure, this kills most people, but she actually, uh, yes, it is called Tong Lin practice also taking and giving. Lo Zhang is also Tong Lin. I think actually Geshe may be talking about it this week. I'm not, I'm not sure anyway, it's commonly talked about. But anyway, my daughter was lost overnight. And you know, it's very traumatic to think of maybe your daughter dying. And so that whole night I practiced this practice thinking about all the other parents whose children had died and trying to take on all of their suffering and uh, and what it would be like. And again, this really was so helpful. It completely calmed my mind. I was able to fall asleep. It was just so amazingly helpful. And then fortunately, the next day, we got a call from the Audubon Society. Uh, my daughter had gotten lost by hiking into the, uh, you know, the water part of the mountain. She'd taken a wrong turn and completely left the ski area. She and a friend of hers realized they were in trouble and they hiked down the entire mountain in their ski boots, ended up at the Audubon Society and called us and we picked them up from the Audubon Society and gave them a ride home. So they were actually fine, but it was, but it was a very traumatic thing. But anyway, this was another case where this taking and giving was so, so powerful. And again, it's the same way. So instead of thinking, oh, my child is maybe dying, you're thinking about somebody else's children. It just takes your mind and puts it on other rather than your own suffering. So anyway, this, this, this Tonglen or Lo Zhang is an amazingly powerful practice. The other part of it is also extremely helpful. And it's something that's known as uh, transforming difficulties onto the path. And it involves, notion, uh, it involves this notion of most of our life actually has a lot to do with difficulties. We're always dealing with this problem, that problem, suffering. And 
And so most of us think, well, we're only doing spiritual practice when we're doing prayers or pujas or meditation. So most of our life, we're doing spiritual practice for this maybe, I don't know, half an hour a day, hour a day. You know, most of us aren't very good at this. So we're doing this spiritual practice for a short part of our life. But this notion of take, taking difficulties and transforming onto the path is a way of thinking about your problems and taking advantage of them to advance yourself spiritually. And again, it involves, you know, just thinking about things in a completely different way, and I don't have time to go into it. But again, it's a very powerful thing, and it's, and it's a way, and it's so powerful because it means that everything that you do becomes part of your spiritual path. So it's not just med simple meditations that are part of your spiritual life. It's like your whole life can become one spiritual path. And, and again, the other thing it does is that when you're going through very difficult situations, they don't feel difficult. They actually feel, they can almost even feel blissful because you're, you're accelerating your spiritual path. So instead of focusing on how terrible it is for you, you are actually moving forward on your spiritual path. And that is so, such a positive, wonderful feeling that you can develop this sort of mind where nothing can ever bother you again. It, you can develop a mind where it doesn't matter. Anything that happens to you doesn't matter because it's all part of your spiritual path and it will lead you faster uh, down the spiritual path. So anyway, this Lo Zhang is a wonderful thing and classes are given at our center all the time. Geshe Sharab has given whole classes on this. I think they're on the, the uh, video library that TNL has. You can look these up and, and this is brought up a lot because it's an amazing, wonderful path. So, so let me stop here and ask if there's any questions. I've sort of dumped a huge amount on you very quickly. And so I, it may, may be very confusing. So are there any questions? Okay, so now I'm gonna move past this. Uh, I'm gonna start talking, um, I'm gonna move into emptiness. So this is the second major topic. But before I do, uh, again, I, I should have been following uh, these verses. So I, I will read the verse from this um, text that I've been going, which is verse nine. And, and, and the handouts for the materials for this course, you can actually get a copy of this text. It says, once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. So again, this is gonna sound like gobbledygook at this point. <laughs> so I'll have to explain it. I don't have time to, to do a long explanation, but Essentially, this is pointing to the final path. So what I'm gonna give you now is the final path. So you've gone through this amazing spiritual development and you're almost ready to achieve Buddhahood. What are the last final steps that you go through at the very end? So this is what this is about. And so, the, so essentially the path you go through is, um, Basically, the fundamental path is said to be three things. The, the first thing that you need is morality. And that means not harming others. Because if you're a good person, your mind will be calm. And, uh, and it'll, it'll be fairly passive. And you need that because the second stage you need is develop great concentration or meditation because you need a powerful mind to take you through the spiritual path. And meditation is, is how you develop this powerful mind. And, uh, and often it's single pointed. There's many different types of meditations. Stephen will talk about it in the next course, but especially at the highest level, there's single pointed meditation where you, are, you can focus on a single thing and your mind never moves away from that thing. And you could do that for minutes, hours, days, months, years. You know, you can develop the discipline that your mind is like rock steady. And why that becomes more powerful is that it becomes, your mind almost becomes like a laser focus. Or you can think about, uh, 
you know, magnifying glass and you hold out the sun and you, you focus it down to a small point and you can take the rays of the sun and you can actually start fires with it if you've got a powerful enough magnifier. And it's that sort of thing. It's like our mind is like all these scattered rays of sunlight and with concentration, you can focus it down to this really small point. And when you do that, what happens is it becomes powerful. It has a huge penetrative ability, especially an ability to understand things. And, and then what you do is you, you develop this concentration and then you focus it on this deepest topic of Buddhism, which is emptiness. And this is, the, and this is what you need to liberate you from samsara. And you use that single pointed focus to understand emptiness at this extraordinarily deep level. And that becomes transformative. And through that deep understanding of emptiness, you can purify all of your negativity and ultimately you will achieve full Buddhahood. So that's sort of the vague, the vague outline. So let me get more explicit. So, and, and again, the, the, these things are, are not just ordinary concentrations. These things are very powerful. So in this first stage, so in the first stage you develop, I, we assume automatically that you've been working on the lower parts of the path and that you have good morality. So you have a calm enough mind so that it's easy to meditate. So then you start meditating and usually people do special retreats to develop the sh shamatha, which is the Sanskrit term for it. In English, they usually translate it as calm abiding. So this is a special, very deep type of meditation. And it takes you know, work. And again, there's all these special techniques that you apply to develop this. Again, I mean, we don't just send you out and say, you know, develop shamatha. You know, there's a whole path and a whole process for developing this thing, which I can't go into. But anyway, what you do when you develop it is your concentration gets better and better. And so gradually you're able to concentrate single pointedly for longer and longer periods. So at first point, maybe, you know, two seconds, you could hold your mind on an object. Then maybe you build up to 10 seconds. Maybe you're really getting a calm mind. You can hold your mind on an object for a whole minute without having it scatter or be distracted or move away from its object. And then eventually you extend it and, you know, half hour, hour. And eventually what happens is this mind becomes, you develop this concentration so powerful. And then again, it's like you hit this threshold at a certain point. I mean, you gradually continuously creep up on this threshold, but at a certain point you hit this threshold and once you hit this threshold, and I guess it's sort of like saying, you know, if you, if you could meditate for, you know, a year, it's almost like an infinite amount of time. So it's, so it almost like goes to infinity. So once you hit this threshold, then actually you could meditate for as long as you want. And once people hit this threshold, they usually have to tell themselves when they sit down for meditation, they tell themselves mentally, okay, I'm going to come out of it an hour from now. And, and that's what happens to these, these, you know, Tibetan monks that go up into the mountains and meditate day and night and stuff. They develop this shamatha, which is so powerful. And you hit this threshold and it's like you're, everything changes. And they say even your physical body develops what they call a pliancy or an ease, which it just feels like cotton. It feels, you know, it, it is no longer a block. So sometimes when some of this sit down to meditate, especially people who sit cross-legged, which I can't do, my knees aren't good enough. But, you know, people that will do that, they'll develop an ache in their knees or, you know, there'll be, their back will start hurting. Once you hit shamatha, it's, you know, it's like your body is like perfect. There's no, you don't feel any pain. There's no obstruction to develop, to meditating at all. It's, it's amazing. I mean, actually, when you hear about this physical aspect, especially all of us that are growing old, we would like it just to get this thing and not feeling any pain. <laughs> so it's this amazing state and it's extraordinarily blissful, extraordinarily blissful. And then, so that's the first step. And actually I was talking about bodhicitta earlier. So we're on the Mahayana path with this. So the next stage that you hit is developing 
spontaneous bodhicitta. And to develop this spontaneous bodhicitta, I'm not sure it's absolutely required, but for most people, they, they really need the power of shamatha or calm abiding. With the power of that consecrated mind is usually how most people develop the spontaneous or real bodhicitta. And when you develop this spontaneous or real bodhicitta, it starts you on the first of five Mahayana paths, which is called the path of accumulation. Because once you develop the spontaneous bodhicitta, then you start generating massive amounts of merit. So you're accumulating merit. So that's why it's called the path of accumulation. Um, so that's the first of these five higher paths that are going to lead to full Buddhahood. The fifth step actually is full Buddhahood. So the first thing is spontaneous bodhicitta. You are now a full-born bodhisattva, and you are this amazing being, just generating all you, the only thing you think about is helping other sentient beings. And you start accumulating huge amounts of merit. At the same time, you start using these meditations to um, meditate on emptiness also. So you start using this very powerful mind to meditate in emptiness, which I will come and explain soon. And eventually you achieve a very deep level of, they call and at this point they're calling it uh, wisdom or so wisdom is the mind that understands emptiness and this, and what you're developing is what they call insight. And again, when you're meditating on this emptiness, you develop, you cross another uh, threshold, which is called special insight. And when you hit this thing, a special insight, again, it's this, again, it's, 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 it's almost like black and white. You finally have hit this amazing, a uh, powerful mind, and it gives you a great suppleness of wisdom. And when you hit that stage, then you then that puts you on the second uh, Buddhist path, which is called the path of preparation. And what, why the reason it's called the path of preparation is because you're getting ready for a direct, you're preparing yourself for a direct realization of emptiness, which is gonna be the third Buddhist path. So at this point, so then once you achieve, and at the same time, usually at the, pretty much at the same time, you achieve this special insight, you achieve what's called the union of calm abiding and special insight. Uh, and this union, it's actually this union that propels you onto this path of preparation, but it usually occurs, I think, pretty much at the same time as you get this special insight. So, so at that point, you have these two minds, you have this mind uh, shamatha or calm abiding where your mind can, you can put it on any object whatsoever and it stays there. But at the same time that, it's, that it can hold objects single pointedly, it can also sort of investigate objects. So it has an invest, an invest uh, a wisdom component at the same time. So it's, you know, it's a mind that's extraordinary. So these are extremely very high paths. These are not trivial accomplishments. You know, you know, the, you know, the, this, this takes a lot of work to get, get reach these stages. So then the next milestone is the third path, which is called the path of seeing. And this involves a direct realization of emptiness. So once you have this union of calm abiding and special insight, you continue to meditate on emptiness. And as you continue to meditate on emptiness, eventually you hit another transformation. And that transformation involves something that none of us have, have ever experienced before. It's actually a, a type of spiritual seeing. It's, it's called a direct realization of emptiness. And so we can only get to this by analogy since we none of us have this type of experience. So in the same way, you can look and see your hand in front of you very clearly if you have good eyesight. It's said that when you hit this direct realization of emptiness, you have a type of spiritual sight that directly sees the truth of emptiness. And to you, emptiness is so obviously true, 
it's as clear to you as a person with good insight can see the hand that's right in front of them. And that is transformative. Once you hit that stage, then, you know, that, then you're very, very close to full Buddhahood. So, so once you have that direct realization of emptiness, then you continue to refine. At that point, you're said to become an Arya being. And uh, so an Arya being is a person that has developed this direct realization of emptiness. And so it said, uh, so an Arya being is sometimes called a noble being. You are a noble being. You are, you are something that is amazingly special now. And once you hit that, you start, you use this powerful mind to purify all your negativities. Once you see the direct realization of emptiness, it purifies all your mind. There's no way that you can really ever do an immoral or harm anybody or whatever. You see the world as it really is. You have a direct realization of the way this deep insight is the way the world really does, works. And so on this path of seeing, you, um, you keep meditating more and more. And eventually, um, I'm forgetting, what is the, uh, I've, forgotten, I've forgotten what the transition is. And then at a certain point, you transitioned into what's called the path of meditation. And, and, and then the path of meditation is this continual meditation on emptiness that takes you to the final fifth stage of full Buddhahood, no more learning. And along this path, uh, you actually, I think it's somewhere along the path of meditation. There's also another thing called uh, bodhisattva or bhumi levels. So there's 10 bhumi levels, which begin at the path of seeing and go to the, the path of uh, no more learning. So there's it's even a finer distinction of, of little separate st stages that you acquire. But as you're going through this, essentially what you do is you first purify all of your negative delusions or afflictions that we talked about in an earlier class, all your, all your blatant negativities. And at some point you achieve what's known as liberation from samsara. You become an arhat. Now, what happens for someone on the Maha, if you're on the Hinayana path, at that point you check out and you become liberated from samsara. And that is the goal of the Hinayana path. And you, and you never have any suffering at all. You're a, a pure being. But as we talked about before, you're not, even though you've conquered all of your overt negativities, there's a slight whiff of negativity that you haven't completely wiped out. And again, the, the way that, you know, for us, we don't, it's hard for us to even imagine it because you're at such an amazingly high level. But the way they talk about it as a way of analogy is take a wooden box, put something that smells really strongly like garlic in it, and close the, put the lid on the box, let it sit for a few days, and then remove the garlic. And once you remove the garlic, the box still smells of garlic. So even though you've removed the garlic, you can still smell the garlic. So that's what this whiff of uh, negativity is like. So, so the analogy would be that you have the box, which is yourself, you, you know, all of this garlic, which has been in there, which is all the negativities of your mind, you purify all of that. So you take, remove the garlic from the box, but then even though you've gotten rid of all the negativities, there's still this little whiff that you can still smell. So, so this first set, when you remove the garlic, those are so, sort of called the obstructive afflictions. So you remove the obstructive afflictions. That's what liberates you from samsara. And now what you do is you get rid of this whiff of the smell. And that is called the obstructions to omniscience. And then when you get rid of that, then you become a full Buddha, a perfect infinite being, and you've achieved your final goal. And even at the time of Buddha, the historical Buddha, uh, the people at that time already noticed that there was a difference between Buddha and many people and of the historical Buddha became arhats. So all of Buddha's 
chief disciples around him all became arhats, liberated from samsara. And so that meant that when they passed away, they were never reborn again. They were in this perfect, wonderful, blissful state of nirvana. Uh, but people noticed that the arhats weren't at the same level as Buddha. Buddha seemed to have this infinite omniscience. He could know, he knew everything, where sometimes the arhats didn't know everything. So it was very clear that there was a very, there was a distinction between being an arhat and someone at the same level of Buddha. But in the Mahayana path, we, we now, we can all become Buddhas. And, uh, and, and so, but what we have to do is we have to hang around in samsara longer. So when we hit enough merit to achieve liberation, we purposely keep ourselves being reborn in samsara so that we can stay in samsara and keep accumulating more and more all of the extra additional infinite merit that's needed to purify these obstructions to admissions and achieve a full Buddhahood. And that's actually part of the reason why you need bodhicitta, because it's painful to be in samsara. And so therefore, you need this powerful motivation of bodhicitta. What drives you to achieve full bodhahood and not check out is because you have such a powerful, amazing compassion to all sentient beings. Let's see, I think I've got some questions coming. Uh, oh, what does omniscience mean? So omniscience means knowing everything. So, I mean, essentially, and, and there are actually some complications or people talked about what is the omniscience of a Buddha, but the Buddha essentially did know everything. Uh, and, and, and the Buddha basically, for, uh, for example, the Buddha knew, he could remember all of his former lifetimes in samsara. He knew exactly what happened every time he was born. The Buddha knew exactly what happened to everybody, every person that died, what happened to him. If something bad happened to somebody, the Buddha understood exactly the karma of what caused that to happen. Uh, at one point, uh, the historical Buddha said he was walking in a forest and he, he, was, he looked, there were all these you know, millions of trees in this gigantic forest. And he took one leaf and he says, you know, he gave the analogy that his knowledge was like all of the leaves in the whole forest, but he was only teaching people this one leaf that they needed to, to know, which is how to remove their suffering, which is the part of the Four Noble Truths. So, um, so anyway, that is the, um, so that takes you all the way to full Buddha. Again, it's very fast. I'm running through this stuff. And you know, quite frankly, in these upper levels, I'm not sure we really know what we're even talking about because uh, these are experiences that just go beyond. You know, What does it mean to be in Nirvana? What does it mean to be a Buddha? Uh, it's said that the Buddhas are there continually helping us, even though they've left the earth as a, you know, the, as a human being. So, so once, so you can achieve full Buddhahood while you're alive, like the historical Buddha. And then when you die, you're never reborn in samsara again. But it's said that the Buddha can still keep helping us. Uh, or you can achieve Buddhahood in the intermediate state, uh, because I, I, again, I didn't have time to discuss this, but according to the other teachings, when you die, you go into the bardo, the intermediate state, and from there you're being reborn. So you can achieve uh, full Buddhahood in this bardo or intermediate state, or sometimes you can be reborn in a, a pure abode, one of these heavenly realms, and achieve Buddhahood there. So there's there's a, a lot more details that I'm not giving you that I, I don't have time in such a, a short course, but uh, but again, I'm just trying to give you sort of the flavor of how it all works. See, we've got another question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody's really amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. I mean, this stuff is, it's amazing that we can even talk about this. Because, you know, when I first heard of Buddhahood, I kept saying, well, enlightenment, that's crazy. You know, that, that must be some impossible thing that you can't understand. But they actually have a path that tells you step by step, this is what you need to do. And in fact, that's what Buddha said. Buddha said, you know, I was at one point exactly the same as all of you are. I followed this path, and when I followed this path, it, I became a Buddha. 
if you follow everything in Buddhism is cause and effect. I, so Buddha said, I created the causes to become a Buddha. If you create the causes to become a Buddha, if you follow the same path that I followed, the one that I'm teaching you, you can become a Buddha too. So it's, it's actually a stunning thing. And I think the, the thing that gives us hope is that as we progress along the spiritual path, we see how it's working on us, how it's making our mind more calm or peaceful, how it helps us be able to handle and deal with difficult situations. And there's actually, quite frankly, as you get higher along the path, there's a lot of amazing bliss, especially in deep meditations. And so, so, so you don't have to wait till the end. In fact, I would say that, you know, even though we have this full goal of Buddhahood, the part of the reason to practice Buddha, uh, Buddhism is just how happy it makes you even moment by moment. And, and again, you have to work at it. It's just, you know, you don't think, oh, I'm a Buddhist, so therefore I'm happy. You have to develop these lines and these qualities that I've been talking about of compassion and love and so forth. But you can try them out and you can see, you can experience yourself. And, and especially, you know, as I said before, meditation is this powerful tool of the mind that really enables you to go far deeper and, and, and meditation isn't the same as just your mind ruminating on things. It's, it's, you have to train yourself how to do meditation correctly for it to have full power. But if you do meditation correctly, it has amazing power. And it's a far more powerful mind than any of our normal conscious waking minds. Okay, so let me stop here. It's about break time, but let me ask if there's any questions first. So again, I've given you all of this uh, amazing deep stuff. And, and again, you, you should always have patience with Buddhist teachings. The first time you hear it, it sounds like mumble jumble. But then after a few times you hear it, it gradually, you, you sort of get over the mental block of hearing all of this unusual terminology and this very strange way of looking at things. So any questions? Okay, so we'll take a 10 minute break. I'll set a little timer for 10 minutes and then I'll come back. And then when we're finished with this, I'll talk about Tantra or the Vajrayana path, the quick path to enlightenment, as they say, and uh, which I think interests a lot of people. So, okay, so I will stop for the moment and turn off my screen and I'll come back to you in 10 minutes. Okay, so we're, uh, it's time to come back now. <laughs> it's always hard, but it's, it's good to get at least a little bit of a break and be able to stretch your legs a little bit or whatever. And so uh, actually during the break, we got a, a very good question from uh, Jenny. Uh, and she was asking about, she was curious how one develops great compassion for all, meaning everyone, you know? And I think that's really the, the nub of the problem. You know, that's the thing that really is so hard for us because especially she was she was giving examples of people, for example, who hurt others, who hurt, hurt animals. You know, there are people who are really vicious and, you know, really harm people in an amazing way. And, and those, uh, that of course is the most difficult step, but you have to get there. So how do you do that? Um, and I think what it is, is that you can't leap there all at once. It's too far to go. It has to be a gradual path. You have to work at this very slowly. And in Buddhism, the way we always work on these difficult things is you start with easy things. So you start really focusing on compassion for your, you know, your own kids, your family, your brothers, sisters, your immediate family, uh, you know, where it's easy to develop love and compassion. Um, and even then, sometimes we have difficult siblings or something like that. So that, that can be your first challenge, maybe a difficult sibling, but even that might be too difficult. So maybe you focus on friends. So, so you try to do the easiest cases first, and then you gradually work to build to more difficult cases. There was actually, um, and it is possible to do this. I mean, there was a, a really interesting thing that the Dalai Lama once talked about. 
So, you know, the Dalai Lama is sort of the informal head of all the Tibetans. And when the Chinese took over Tibet, he escaped. And um, when he escaped, um, there were still a lot of Tibetans left in Tibet. And these people were often horrendously tortured by the Chinese and so forth. But people, even now, gradually, occasionally, small numbers escape either into India or Nepal or the neighboring countries. And whenever they do, they are always granted an audience with the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama gives them a personal audience because the Tibetan people are so precious to him. And he relates this one interesting story about how a, uh, he met this one Tibetan person. I'm not sure whether it was a monk or a lay person. And, this, and he asked this person, how was it there? And this person said, it was awful. You know, you can't believe how horrible it was. And, the, and so the Dalai Lama, you know, being very kind, he says, well, you know, what was the worst thing of all? What was so hard about it? And the person said, he said, I almost, I came very, very close. I almost started hating my guards. <laughs> So that was what the worst thing was. The worst thing was is that he he you know he was trying to keep a good Buddhist compassionate mind, but being under these extreme situations of horrible torture and horrible things happening to him, he almost came close to hating his tormentors, and that was that was his biggest uh, worst moment. So so it does show that it is possible to develop these things, even under extreme situations. Um, okay, so I, I don't have time to talk about that. Uh, we are also, uh, uh, yeah, Divya was also asked about emptiness and you were absolutely correct. I got so carried away with the final path to, to the um, Buddhahood, I forgot to tell you about emptiness. And part of that is because I, I reversed the normal order I talked about it, so I was skipping ahead. So yes, we absolutely, we need to talk about emptiness. Um, so emptiness, it's described in many ways, you know, and, and emptiness is said to be the most difficult thing in all of Buddhism to understand. And, and so it's like in everything in Buddhism, everything in Buddhism is continual. So we can't jump from where we are now to a full understanding of Buddhism. But what we, again, the way we work at it is we go through it sort of gradually. And emptiness is so important because it's these meditations on emptiness that purifies your negativities. So you have to have a correct notion of emptiness, especially near the end. Uh, of course, any approximate uh, ideas that you develop a, of emptiness along the way, even if they're only partially correct, still are amazingly helpful and amazingly beneficial in helping you practice the path. Um, and it is possible to develop various ways, various analogies and ways of looking at it that you can sort of get the main idea. And um, so I th so maybe the simplest way of looking at it is to say that emptiness is the way that things exist. So what gets everybody into trouble when they start talking about emptiness is they think that emptiness means non-existence. And that is not true. So in Buddhism, things absolutely exist. The problem is, is not whether they exist or not, but it's how they exist. So that's what emptiness is to get at. Emptiness is all about how things exist. And what the Buddha said is, is that for most of us, we make a mistake in how we think about how things exist. And, uh, and in fact, what Buddha said is it's almost not how we think about it. He, he said that this way of thinking about it has been so imprinted into us through so many billions of previous lifetimes that it's almost like an innate way of thinking about it. So it's really the way that we view how things exist is so built into us that we can't really even see it. It's like a fish swimming in water. 
You know, the fish just doesn't see the water. So that's the problem. That's what makes emptiness so difficult for us is that it's there right in front of us, but we're so used to it that we just think, oh, well, it is the way things really are. And we don't see that we're making a mistake. So that's, that's what makes emptiness so difficult. So um, the other thing that is true also in emptiness, if you go to, uh, there's whole thick books written on emptiness. Don has just recently given a whole class on emptiness. He's teaching the Heart Sutra on Wednesdays, which is mainly about emptiness. Uh, when you go to these classes, you also discover that there's people talk about emptiness in different ways. And, uh, and emptiness also, the, the most important emptiness is the emptiness of, of the self, which usually goes under the name of selfless. And, and so that was the thing that Buddha, especially, there's a notion that's called anatman, which means atman is self in uh, uh, Sanskrit, and on means not, so not self or selfless. That was the, the deepest, that's the way the Buddha actually talk, talked about emptiness. Although the, the historical Buddhism, Buddha did occasionally use the word emptiness. But so, so what is this emptiness and why do they use this word emptiness? Technically, emptiness means emptiness of inherent existence. That's what the technical words mean. So this means absolutely nothing to you at this point. So I have to explain this. <laughs> So what is inherent existence? So when you say inherent existence, the problem is people think that inherent existence is the same thing as existence. So inherent existence is not the same thing as existence, but it's a mode of existence. It's how things exist. And the way that what inherent existence means is it means that things exist. I'll, I'll use the words and then I'll explain it. The typical words that people use for inherent existence is they say that things exist from their own side, uh, that they have their own inherent nature. And so that sounds a little bit strange. So the idea of it is, is that if a thing inherently exists, it creates its own existence which again will sound a little bit strange and that's why it's so difficult to understand. So, you know, if I have a block of wood sitting in front of me, if I think of it as inherently existent, it just, it, it exists independent of me, it has nothing to, it just exists all by itself and it's creating its own existence. And that's the way it seems to us. I mean, we look out at the external world and it looks like we have these external objects and these external objects just, exist all by themselves. You know, it's like, you know, if, if, if we're outside a forest and a tree falls over, you know, just because we didn't experience means it doesn't happen. But, you know, yes, it did happen. The tree did fall over even though we didn't experience. So it looks like the tree falling over was just something that happened completely independently all by itself. And so this seems to us absolutely correct. But what it is, is, is it's, it's actually what we don't understand is that when we start thinking in these ways of things is existing on by themselves, by their own very nature, what we are doing is we are actually adding a concept and putting that concept on top of the way things really exist. Because, and, 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 and so there's, there's lots of logical reasons that lead you to this, but a lot of those logical reasons have you to do uh, one of the, some of the best reasoning has to do with uh, sort of consequences. So if things did inherently exist, what would be the consequences? Well, one of the consequences would be, so if a thing created its own existence and was completely independent of everything else, it just sat there, then it would sit there forever. It would never change because it's happy. It just creates its own existence. So it just keeps creating its own existence forever. And it just sits there forever. And we know that's not true. We know that everything changes in the world. And why do things change? Because of causes and conditions, because other things influence that object. And in fact, you know, even if you took something like a, a piece of wood that's just sitting there, well, what happens if you put it in a moist environment? Well, it'll start to rot out. So it's not independent of everything else that's going on to it. What happens if you change the temperature of that piece of wood? put it inside a furnace at a very high temperature. It would spontaneously burn up. 
So in a sense, things really don't inherently exist. And we sort of know they don't inherently exist. And, but it's just our normal way of doing that. We, our mind just naturally, when we look around the world, we just clunk things into objects. Another thing, uh, another part of the issue that are ways of the arguments that come up for inherent existence is things of parts of one versus many. So if you take any complicated thing, like let's say a table, a table, table is actually a good one. It's a simple thing, tabletop, four legs. So we look at that table as a single object. But if you look at that thing as a single object, you can say, well, you know, actually it's composed of five things. It's got four legs and a tabletop. So how can it be one thing if it's composed of many things? And when you start thinking about that, you after a while you can realize it's our mind that creates this fiction that it's a single entity. It's really a bunch of things all put together. Or even take a thing like a single piece of wood. We say, oh, that's just a single thing. It doesn't even have a part. Well, then take an ax and chop it up into splinters and so then you have millions of parts. So you can see even what we think of as a single thing has many parts. So we keep imposing the single unity thing on top of these very complicated things that have lots of parts. And so what are we doing? Our mind is superimposing additional concepts. It's interpreting the world in a special way. It's interpreting the world as a world of single individual objects that sit out there that look like they're independent of everything else, that are just happy to sit there, independent of us, independent of everything else. But actually the whole world is interconnected. Everything in the world affects everything else. You can't have anything that's ever, you can never isolate any object completely from the world. And, uh, and so anyway, that, that's what emptiness is. Emptiness means that actually everything, what, one way of thinking of it is what's called dependent origination, which is the way the Bo historical Buddha often talked about. The historical Buddha said, everything has causes and conditions. Anything that's going on has causes and conditions that brought it into that state of being. And over time, causes and conditions will operate on that object and cause it to change. Nothing remains eternally the same. So if things were inherently existent, there'd have to be objects that never change. But actually our whole world, everything in our world changes. So nothing is inherently existent. So, so that's the idea. So, you, so, so when you look at that idea, Again, I, I don't have time to go. I get, again, there's whole books on it. I'm just giving you a brief glimpse of it. But you sort of say, well, that's great. But how does that lead me out of samsara? You know, what's the problem with that in samsara? So the most important object that we look at is self. So we have an idea that we have a real self. So, you know, we give our name to ourselves. I'm Bob. So my self is named Bob. And I think of myself as this permanent, you know, we think of ourselves as permanent selves, you know, and, 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 and sometimes uh, the other way it comes in and in, in Christian conditions, I, I was born and grew up in a Catholic environment and used to talk about the soul. So there was this permanent soul that everybody had and it was your soul that went on to heaven and so, or hell or whatever. So you had the soul, this permanent thing. And that's the way we often think. We think that we have this permanent self. And even if you don't think you have a soul, you know, I think all of us think of, you know, we talk about my body, my mind. We think of ourselves as having a self that's sort of in control of our body and mind. In reality, if you ask yourself, are you really in control of your mind and your body? No. If I were in control of my body, my body would never hurt again. <laughs> My body would be an Olympic star. If I were in control of my mind, I would never have a, a bad moment of mental, you know, mind moment ever again. You know, in fact, in fact, we're not in control of any of this. And in fact, our the thing that we think of ourselves, normally the thing that we, we think of ourselves is composed of a body and a mind. And a body and a mind has parts. It has at least two parts, a body and a mind, but actually it has more parts than that because our bodies have legs, hearts, muscles, all these other things. Our mind has emotions, thoughts, concepts, all sorts of things. So actually we're this huge complex mess and this huge complex mess 
we think of as, oh, I'm just Bob, you know, this whole complex mess, body and mind, I'm just Bob. We think of it as a single thing. And again, that's an imposition. That's, we call it a superimposition. We impose this notion of person on top of this mess. And in, in fact, it's because our body has all of these parts that we change. I mean, our body parts grow old, eventually will die. Our mind is constantly changing. You know, the mind we have now is completely different than we have as the mind of a young child. So even though I think of I'm Bob, and I think of myself as being the same Bob from the moment I was born until now, uh, you know, I was a vastly different Bob when I was young. So actually this Bob is a complete fiction. There is no permanent Bob that's been hanging around. All it is, is this complex blob of body and mind that's constantly changing. And that will continue on into our next life. So in our next life, we'll acquire a new body and our karma will direct the kind of body and the kind of mind that we get. And they really say that it's really our karma that reincarnates. So we have, we have a continuity of mind. So a conscious, so we have a consciousness that continues moment by moment throughout our entire life. When we die, that consciousness goes through the bardo and then it's reborn into some other being and continues on. But that consciousness is constantly changing. There's no permanent thing. You know, there's no label on this consciousness. There's no little label inside the consciousness that says Bob on it. It's just this consciousness thing that's changing. So if you ask me, so if somebody asked me who I am, I would probably give them the history of my life because that's the only way I can identify myself. I, you know, I can sort of say, well, what kind of emotions? Am I a happy guy or sad guy now? You know, you know how do I live and so forth? Uh, but you know, that's different than having a real identity. So this real identity of Bob herself is actually a fiction, but it's a useful fiction. You know, it's like, you know, we couldn't go around saying, well, with this blob of body and mind, you know, it's, it's useful to have a name and for, for interacting with people, but there is a, a fiction. And so, so that's what emptiness is about. It's that nothing is permanent. There is no permanent fixed nature to anything. And that's what helps us escape from samsara. Because for example, uh, one way we get into trouble is we think we have enemies and we hate those enemies. And we hate those enemies so much that we do terrible things. And that creates negative karma, which leads to suffering. Well, actually, when you realize the notion of emptiness, you realize that there's no enemy. The enemy is just this fiction, this projection of our mind that labels that person as enemy. Actually, that person is a constantly changing blob of emotions and all sorts of things. And that person is constantly changing. And in fact, maybe if we got to know that person better, we may realize that we had mistaken notions of them and the things that we thought were annoying, we actually see the good parts of them. And so they actually can become our friend. So nothing is permanently an enemy or a friend. It's just our projection, our label. And people are just, you know, a complex group of emotions and things, you know, people, sometimes people do good things and sometimes people do bad things. But if people are who are doing think bad things aren't bad people, they are just people who are, have mistaken notions in their mind screen that cause them to do negative actions. And they can change and they will change. And people will get better, people will get worse. People are just constantly changing. There is no such thing as an enemy or a friend. There's just constantly changing things. Even your children, you have children of this life, but you will die, they will die. And who knows where you will re re be reborn or whatever. You will have different lives, different children. So they aren't per permanently your children. They're just a, a beings that you have temporarily had as children. So it's, you know, it's so that's what the notion of emptiness has. And that's why it has such a profound impact on helping you escape samsara. We don't fixate on this permanence of everything. And once you realize, and in fact, it's because things do change that a spiritual path is possible. Because if you change the way you look at the world, which will then cause you to change the way you behave in this world, you can follow a spiritual path. And, and you aren't stuck. There's nobody that's stuck as being a bad person. There's nobody that's stuck being an angry person. Some, sometimes people say, oh, I'm just an angry person. 
Yeah, well, you're an angry person because you developed a lot of bad habits, which made you an angry person. But if you start changing those bad habits, you can become a patient, good person. And that's happened over and over again, to billions of people. And you can do that too. So if you, if you start changing your behavior, if you start, and especially what's most helpful in Buddhism is changing the way you look. A lot of Buddhism is about getting you to look at the world in a different way, which is wisdom. And so, so anyway, that's sort of the rough ideas that encompass um, emptiness. Um, again, it's hard to talk about it in five minutes. <laughs> But, but let me ask if there's any questions. That's, so this is just giving you a, a rough idea. And what I would say, in fact, the, the Buddha said this in one, one of the historical sutras. He said, actually think about how everything is impermanent. Because if you always think that everything is impermanent, it pushes you in the right direction. Because an inherently existent object is, not, is the opposite of impermanent. An inherently existent object would be permanent. So if you just think everything is impermanent, it pushes you. It's not the same as emptiness, but boy, it certainly pushes you a long way in the right direction. And, and, it, and it's so helpful to your spiritual life is to constantly meditate on the impermanence of everything. And in fact, there were three things that Buddha said you, you should always meditate on. One is the suffering that's inherent in the nature of life. The second, but the second one was impermanence. And the third one was this notion of selflessness. So I don't know, probably I've confused you all, but I don't know if that's, if I've made it muddier or, or not. Um, but it, it, it's a vast topic. And it's the sort of thing actually that you need to hear over and over again. You have to go to many different teachings over and over again to, to sort of develop a, an understanding of Buddhism. It takes a long time. And even people like the Dalai Lama, even very advanced people talk about how difficult it is to get the, the really correct understanding of emptiness. But it's something that you sort of creep up on slowly by you know, going to more and more teachings, hearing about it over and over again, and thinking about it and trying to relate it to your own life. So are there, are there any questions on this? Okay, I probably overwhelmed you all, I'm sorry. <laughs> so now let me go very quickly into Tantra. I've only got a few minutes left. Um, so what Tantra or the Vajrayana path is, is in a way I sort of look about, it's not separate from the Mahayana path. In fact, if you're gonna practice Tantra or also called the, the Vajrayana path, um, yeah, somebody asked, yeah, consciousness is considered to be empty because consciousness also has no permanent nature. It's constantly changing. So if consciousness were not had an inherent nature, it would always be the same. It would always be fixed and always the same, but it's empty of inherent nature. So even consciousness is constantly changing. And so it's also empty of inherent nature. Okay, so anyway, so this tantric path is in a certain sense, the culmination of the Mahayana path. And to practice it, you need a bodhicitta motivation. So when you're practicing the bodhi, bodhicitta motivation, um, um, yeah, so, so, so essentially, if you don't have a bodhicitta uh, med, uh, motivation, essentially you won't get anywhere. So you can do all the tantric meditations and so forth, you won't get anywhere. So you absolutely have to have a bodhicitta motivation in order to practice Tantra or Vajrayana. Uh, the second thing you need is you need an empowerment or an initiation. You need a special uh, spiritual ceremony that implants the spiritual power on you to practice this path. And so, uh, these, so these, these things are given in, in, in the old days in Tibet, these were, these were only given very rarely. And a master teacher would only give them to a few select disciples that he thought was very uh, ready for them. And tantric and Vajrayana teachings were considered to be very secret because they were so powerful because they are the fast path to enlightenment. It's said that with 
that normal path with bodhicitta could take you eons to become a Buddha. But if you do this Vajrayana or tantric path, you could, you could become a Buddha within this very single lifetime, even within a few months, if you do it very powerfully. So, it, so the, this Vajrayana and tantric path is extremely powerful, but it has to be done with bodhicitta because to access something so powerful, it has to have a similar power driving. So it's clearly a part of the Mahayana path, but it's like an accelerated Mahayana path. And uh, normally, uh, and there's, there's actually different classes of Tantra. There's Action Tantra, Yoga Tantra, uh, different things. The ones that people normally foc on, focus on are highest Yoga Tantra. That's the most powerful one. Uh, it is very common for teachers to give what's known as Action Tantra. And in fact, we've had many teachers come through uh, TNL and have given us various action tantric empowerments. Uh, but the highest one is the highest yoga tantric, and that is the one that is the, really the, the quick path to enlightenment. Although these action tantras are helpful, they're, they're helpful for getting you into the, this path. Uh, this path is said to uh, require strong faith because they. They teach you, a, a lot of it has to do with very complex visualizations. And unless you have strong faith that this is actually a powerful path, I think most of us would look at these very complicated things and say, oh, this is nutty. <laughs> you know, because they, they talk about a lot of strange things. And so it requires actually a guru to lead you through this. And you've got to have confidence that this guru is really knows what he's talking about and that this is going to work. Uh, there are two stages to the uh, tantric or Vajrayana path, a generation stage and completion stage, at least at the highest yoga tantra. The generation stage involves uh, a lot of practice of meditations, a lot of ritual practice, but essentially you're meditating on yourself as a Buddha. So you imagine yourself as a Buddha. And usually you pick, you, you pick certain uh, tantric Buddhas for which you do the practice, like Vajrayogina, Haruka, people like that. And, 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 and people that practice this generation stage, part of why it's such a quick path is that if you imagine yourself truly to be that Buddha, then you have to start acting like that Buddha. And then we start getting in no, into these notions of emptiness. If you are acting like that Buddha, you're acting like a pure, perfect being. So if you act like a pure, perfect being, perhaps you are that Buddha. So it's really a quite interesting idea. So what's the difference between you and a pure, perfect being if everything you do is the same actions as a pure, perfect being? So anyway, it's a very interesting thing to think about. But that's what this sort of generation stage has to do with. It has to do with a lot of complex visualizations where, again, step by step, slowly you train yourself to develop these amazing visualizations. And some of these practitioners are amazing. You know, it's like they, they take the icons, you know, the, the pictures of the Buddhas that you see in Tonkas and stuff. And sometimes these things have horns or something like that. And it was said that there was this one practitioner who used to duck as he went through every doorway so his horns wouldn't hit the top of the doorway. <laughs> so, 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 so again, and, and these involve very deep meditations. And again, the deeper, more powerful you can meditate, the more powerful this practice begin, becomes. And it generates huge amounts of positive karma, of course. Gen completion stage is like a whole level deeper just a whole level deeper. And in principle, they always talk about starting generation stage and then moving to completion stage. In practice, most people move on a parallel path. So they actually do both simultaneously. But completion stage is, is the stage where, this is the stage where you really need to have deep faith in a guru or teacher, because uh, it actually digs deep into your psyche, actually. And you actually imagine yourself as having sort of a psychic body. So you start talking, thinking about having a subtle body and mind. 
and they start talking about things like winds, channels, drops. So these are the things where you have the, the chakras, the central channel, and all of the stuff that you often, uh, Buddhism has similar things also. And you do imaginations and, um, and, 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 and these imaginations take you to very deep places. And in fact, it's, it's actually helpful to have a, uh, a guru because sometimes you can go very deep into your psyche. And uh, so sometimes people can even have some sort of psychological disturbances. So, it's, so you, it's, it's, it's very powerful, but it's but because things that are very powerful are a little bit dangerous and it's very helpful to have the guidance for what you can do. And again, you, again, you start on simpler levels and you go deeper and deeper. Um, uh, let's see, what, what else can I say about it? But, but in a certain sense, especially when you go to this generation stage, you actually also experience very deep levels. You learn that there's deeper levels of mind. So there's a coarse mind, a subtle mind, and a very subtle mind. And actually, when you fall asleep, you experience your subtle mind. And at the moment you die, your body contracts from your coarse to your subtle to a very subtle mind. And it's actually that very subtle mind that goes on to your next rebirth. And in these completion stage meditations, you can actually, normally you can't access that very subtle mind. Uh, normally it only comes out at death or in a very certain small number of situations, but with completion stage meditations, if you go deep enough, if you can get to the right meditations, you can actually simulate the death path. You can actually experience your very subtle mind. And in fact, the goal, the reason why you can achieve full enlightenment in the bardo is at the, or at the moment of dying is because at the moment of dying, if you can gain control over this very subtle mind and direct it toward a meditation on emptiness, this very subtle mind has no distraction whatsoever. It's only your coarse minds that actually can be distracted that can have negativities. This very subtle mind is a completely pure mind and it's, a, and it's the most powerful mind of all, completely undistracted, if it meditate, if you can use this very subtle mind to meditate on emptiness, then you achieve a direct realization of emptiness and pretty quickly full enlightenment. So you use this very subtle mind to meditate on emptiness, and that's how you can achieve uh, Buddhahood at the moment of death. And by doing these completion stage meditations, you can actually develop the ability to work with this. Because for most of us, when we die, we pass through the stage of our very subtle mind. We don't even know it's there. We just shoot right past it and we can't use it for anything. But when you go into these completion stage meditations, you start dealing with this very subtle stuff that is very, very powerful. So that's probably, I, let's see, I think we have one question here. Uh, oh, okay, somebody has to leave. Um, so I would say that, um, so anyway, I. I, I've run over my time and I should uh, probably, but anyway, this tantric path, and, and you, maybe I've said enough where you can start to see how powerful it is. Uh, but, but, it, but it's ways of, and, and these, again, when you go into these completion stage meditations, you can really do a lot of purification and purify a lot of your negativities. And they, these minds are just very powerful, but they're very deep and, especially in the completion stage, you know, they involve all these exotic things of chakras, channels, winds, and all sorts of things. So it's, so it's, uh, so it requires a lot of explanation. And, and as I said, to, you know, I mean, you can, you can buy books and read all about it and you can read all of the uh, meditations and stuff, but they won't do any good. They won't have any power. Uh, unless you have uh, a tantric initiation. And it is possible different centers and different parts of the world give tantric initiations. The, the Dalai Lama occasionally gives different tantric initiations. And there are different types of tantra you can practice. Even highest yoga tantric has different yidams or these tantric deities. And there are different paths you can follow depending on which 
guru gives you the empowerment or whatever. And, and I think they're, they're, they're all good, you know, it's, uh, but, but some of them involve a lot more complicated practice than others. And they also involve various commitments. So if you're practicing these passive, these very high level paths, you should be doing certain types of spiritual practices every day and so forth. So, so let me stop here and let me ask if there's any questions. Okay, so, so I, think I, I've, I think I've covered all, I've already covered all of the main paths and uh, actually run over almost 10 minutes, but so I've given you pretty much everything and four, four outings. <laughs> I've made my goal compressing from five to four. Um, so I, I guess that's all. I'm, uh, again, this course, uh, this particular class tonight has been recorded. So hopefully they will then put it on the TNL website. And so you'll be able to listen to it again. And maybe that will, you know, I, I've had to go very fast to get through all of this material. So I probably overwhelmed you, but sometimes if you listen to it again, you hear more. So that's certainly possible. And this class will again repeat, I think, uh, for the four weeks of March uh, is my understanding. So anyway, thank you so much for all, all for joining and uh, I'll uh, wish you good night and wish you well. Thank you so much. Thank all you,